Now I'd just like to take the opportunity to um, introduce our panelists. So um, Peter, would you like to start? Everybody, thanks for being here. Uh, welcome virtually to Oberlin. It's as sunny here in real life today as it is in the background of, of Jody Kirshner's image there. So we're accurately representing in our virtual world. Uh, my name is Peter Swenson. I'm class of 99. Uh, my teaching home in Oberlin is in the Tamara department, technology and music and related arts. Uh, right now, my, my actual home is in the Dean's office, where I'm the Associate Dean for Academic Affairs uh, for the Conservatory of Music. And I work a lot with my colleagues in the College of Arts and Sciences on programs that cross over between the conservatory and the college. Jody, I think you're next. Yes. Hello, everybody, and welcome. Thank you for joining us today virtually at Oberlin College and Conservatory of Music. My name is Jody Kirshner, and I'm Professor of Music Education and also the Division Director of PACE, which is Pedagogy, Advocacy, and Community Music Engagement. Hello, everyone. Good to see all of you. Thank you for joining us. My name is Tiffany Chang, and I am Class of 2009. I, um, and the, I am the conductor of the Oberlin Arts and Sciences Orchestra, and I also teach uh, conducting courses at Oberlin. All right, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Olivia Fink. I am a fourth year musical studies major with a German minor. Um, and I've kind of been all over the place at Oberlin, but I have spent a lot of time in the conservatory studying um, conducting and education, actually quite closely with Professor Kirshner and Professor Chang on this panel, um, which is so special. I'm so happy to be here. But yeah, I know a lot about uh, vocal ensembles here at Oberlin, and um, I'm basically majoring in how college students can be involved with the conservatory, so very happy to be here. Hi, uh, my name is Evan or Ev. I use she, her pronouns and I'm a second year here at Oberlin um, and I'm planning to major in psychology and Africana studies. Um, so yeah. Awesome, thank you all for those wonderful introductions. I think most of you out there might have seen my name before. My name is Ryan. I work in the conservatory admissions office as the assistant director. Um, and so I'm kind of like in charge of handling a bunch of application stuff as well as our social media channels. Um, you might have seen me on my new show called Ask Ryan Anything. Um, I also um, am really excited to share about the music opportunities because I am an alum and I started off in the college and then added the conservatory as part of the double degree program. So I know a lot about those opportunities and options and pathways for college students in specific. I majored in classical voice and English and I'm from Chicago. So I'm sure some of you out there may have questions as well about coming from a big city or a more metropolitan area to our nicely secluded Oberlin, Ohio. So um, now that we've gotten that out the way, um, I wanted to begin with kind of talking a little bit of more about some of the opportunities that our students have actually um, gotten involved in. So as Olivia, you both have talk talk briefly about some of the things you've done musically i'd love to know a little bit more Ev, i think you mentioned that you were a part of um, an acapella group can you talk a little bit about that yeah so oberlin has you know um, a good handful of acapella groups on campus and i am a part of one of them i actually just joined um this semester and we're doing it virtually so like virtual auditions and all that um i auditioned and got in um the name of the acapella group is pitch please and it is one of um or it's like Oberlin's only all genre, all gender um, acapella group. And yeah, so we sing a little bit of everything um, and our rehearsals have been all virtual. So that's been really interesting to um, kind of be a part of that group and like see how um, everything's kind of shifted to virtual. Awesome. And I'm actually going to put a link. I'm a big link share everyone. So I'm actually going to share a bunch of links throughout this session. But right now, here's a link to our web page that talks a little bit about our um, student organizations. We have over 175 and there are actually six acapella groups on our campus. So if you're big into, you know, acapella music, per uh, pitch perfect, all of that stuff, right, you'll find a community here on Oberlin's campus. Olivia, you've done a lot of amazing work, particularly with Tiffany this past semester. Can you talk a little bit about the work you've done in the ensembles here at Oberlin? 
Absolutely. Yeah, that might be a somewhat long answer. So I'll try to to keep it relatively short. First, I just wanted to say I was also in Pitch Please for a semester at Oberlin. Been very much, like I said, all over the place in ensembles, but that was really fun. That was during um, my second year. Um, but yeah, so last semester, like you just mentioned, I was so fortunate to work with Professor Chang on this international virtual collaboration and also collaboration with the University of Rochester on the Beethoven, a choral fantasy. That was just one piece out of a, a program of three other pieces, but I was the chorus master for that. Um, like I said before, I have a minor in German. So I just kind of jumped on all of the German diction because the text is in German and um, gave a lot of, of, of choral notes and a lot of different virtual videos and got to work with somewhat virtually, somewhat detached, but all good with a, a lovely group of, of um, of singers, which was fantastic. And we had originally planned to do that in person, but we made it work virtually. And in my opinion, I think it was it was quite a triumph. Um, but yes, so at Oberlin in ensembles, in terms of vocal ensembles, I have also been all across the board. At Oberlin, we have um, the Oberlin College Choir, which the name is kind of misleading. It's a choir that's ensemble to that is required to take by uh, by voice majors, but you can audition in Obviously, there's a there's a large percentage of college students in there. Um, I also conducted the college choir last semester, which was really great. There's opportunities for conducting students like in around your senior year, and that's a whole other conversation. And a college choir often did large masterworks in collaboration with the Musical Union, which is like a 75 to potentially around 100 person ensemble that has faculty members, community members, students of any majors at Oberlin. It's non audition you can just join, and it's a fantastic choral tradition. We also have have the Eclagium Musicum Ensemble, um, which performs uh, medieval and Renaissance music. That's an ensemble I'm in right now. Also, Dr. Risto, um, the conductor of Oberlin College Choir and Musical Union, recently made an eight-person uh, vocal ensemble, chamber vocal ensemble, um, this past semester. Um, it's been a year of chamber music for the conservatory, which is great. It's, it's another experience, but that is also a place where I've had um, vocal experience. Um, and in terms of ensembles um, or in terms of conducting, I have taken two years of um, orchestral and choral conducting um, lessons um, with Tiffany Chang and also with Dr. Kirshner and uh, Dr. Risto and uh, Rafael Jimenez, um, which has been great. Um, I'm, I, feel like, I feel like I'm talking so much, wow. Um, no, no, but essentially no. that's been a large part of my study. No. And I've also conducted my own ensembles. That is a big part of my time at Oberlin as well. I love, can you actually pull up the link for that? I'm sorry, I don't have that link at the ready. So if you want to pull up the link to share that, I would love for you to um, share the information in the chat. We are Which starting one? to get some questions. Um, what What would you like me, I said a lot of things. Oh, Which I'm sorry, about share? your, the, I believe you were talking about the Phlox ensembles. Yes, yeah, that yes. was, I Could can you, find a link. Yes. Thank you. Um, but we did, We got a couple of questions, and actually, this is wonderful. I'm loving this. Send in your questions, folks. Um, we have some questions for Tiffany um, related to the Arts and Sciences Orchestra. So we have two, actually. One is um, in regards to the type of repertoire that the ensemble plays, and the other one is in it, it's involved around the instrumentation. So what kind of instruments are playing in the Arts and Sciences Orchestra? Yeah, sure. I'd be happy to uh, shed some light on that. Uh, those are some excellent questions. Um, the orchestra, for me, I believe, is a place where we can really bring the full conservatory experience to everyone who's interested in playing in an orchestra. And uh, so we aim to select repertoire that involves a full orchestral ensemble. So string instruments, woodwind instruments, brass instruments, percussionists, and we've even, we've even had pianists in the ensemble as well. And um, our membership is typically made up of um, a combination of students in the arts and sciences, College of Arts and Sciences, um, students who are in the conservatory, but perhaps minoring in a secondary instrument or minoring in comp or majoring in composition. Um, we also have members from the community that join us. So we have members ranging from uh, a high school sophomore to um, uh, folks from our local retirement community, uh, Kendall at Oberlin. So we, we, our age range ranges from 13 to 84 and everything in between, lots of different interests. And I think that that's one of the special things about the ensemble is that we all collectively 
bring so many different perspectives to the ensemble and we're interested in having new experiences. So one of the things that I really focus on is how can we reimagine the idea of the orchestra? And so it's not just the orchestra as let's play a lot of Beethoven and Brahms, but it is let's play the Beethoven and Brahms, but also the new music that was written yesterday. And so um, different kinds of collaborations with singers, with choirs, collaborations with video artists, collaborations with dancers. So we've kind of done all of that in the last two and a half years that I have been um, le leading this ensemble. And that has been, it, it has been really amazing for me to see just how everyone just eats it up. Whatever I throw at them, everyone just takes and like goes the extra mile. And that's really inspiring for me to see as a leader because um, we are all in charge of making the music happen. And I feel like that students at Oberlin really want to do everything they can to be involved in music. So um, we also involve uh, a lot of guest artists as part of our programming. So we involve um, conservatory faculty and concertos um, as soloists. We also invite guest artists from the local um, com community to, to per perform with us in various um, in various situations. And, um, and the idea is that one of the, th the things that I really try to do is to program at least one piece every concert that you have never heard of before. Awesome, so, thank you, Tiffany. Yeah, thank A you. quick follow-up question um, is, when do auditions happen for the Arts and Sciences Orchestra? Sure, so auditions typically happen at the beginning of the fall semester, usually the weekend before the first day of classes. And uh, there will be signups typically beginning um, August 1st. And the repertoire for the auditions will be up also by August 1st. Um, having said that, the auditions are also rolling because we operate on a semester schedule. So even if you don't participate in the fall semester, you can audition during the fall semester for the spring semester. And so um, we really want to engage as many people as possible. So there is a rolling audition process as well. Awesome. And I just included the link to your ever amazing Instagram account and your website for the ensemble. So those interested in the Arts and Sciences Orchestra should definitely check that out. Um, we had a couple of lessons about our secondary lessons program. Peter, would you mind kind of overviewing what that is? Or actually, no, I'm sorry, I'm going to redirect that question. Jody Kirshner, can you talk a little bit about secondary lessons, considering that's kind of connected to our pace division? Yeah, you know, secondary lessons, that kind of doesn't really sum up the, the value or the quality of the experience. Secondary is more of an administrative um, um, part of a, a title, a label to keep those students who are taking private lessons as conservatory majors and those students who are taking private lessons in the conservatory with faculty or students, um, uh, but yet they are enrolled as a part of the College of Arts and Sciences. So secondary lessons refers to those students who are non-majors uh, taking private lessons with faculty or students. Um, students audition for uh, secondary lessons, uh, the private lessons, and depending on the availability, uh, in a teacher's studio, depending on the area, um, if this, the, the ability level and the opening is available in a, in a faculty studio, then there might be a possibility for uh, students to study with a faculty member. Um, if there's not space or the, the ability level um, isn't uh, yet as developed as perhaps some of the other uh, students in the, the studios, uh, then they may be assigned to an approved uh, student teacher in the college, uh, in sorry, in the conservatory, a major, a performance major, uh, who has uh, theoretically done um, pedagogy courses, ha is still supervised by a faculty person. Um, Peter, jump in <laughs> if I'm missing something. <laughs> um, but yes, uh, one can take those lessons for two credits um, uh, with a student or with a faculty. That I was, believe the lessons are typically 30 minutes. Is that true, Peter? Yep. Frank? yep. Yeah, and, you know, I think students, on the one hand, private lessons sort of 
might suggest that this is something on which you already have a lot of skills, but I think that these lessons are also used on our campus for students who want to acquire new skills or, you know, who perhaps uh, learned an instrument during um, their time at home and kind of picked up a secondary instrument on the side and now would like to study it. So, you know, it's, it's sort of an open door in terms of what that means to students. Um, if it's not your major, uh, what, what form those lessons can take and then also how those lessons might intersect with ensemble performance. You know, if you're in an acapella group, you might take voice secondary lessons, something like that. Also with the more official chamber music, if you're taking violin lessons, you might also be in a string quartet or you might be in Tiffany's uh, orchestra, you know? So there's a lot of that kind of connecting of the dots and the lessons are one piece of that kind of bigger network of, of performance opportunities. Yeah, you guys hit it on the nail. I mean, the only thing I would add to this is that given that Oberlin is focused on undergraduate students. This is a really awesome opportunity for our students to be able to learn how to work with their peers and, and other students and townsfolk in this way, right, to build those skills and kind of get those tools under their tool belt, um, particularly because oftentimes at larger universities, teaching opportunities go to graduate students. And so our undergrads get that opportunity to really work closely um, in one-on-one -on -one individual lessons. And I believe there was a specific question about how often they're offered and they are offered for a half hour. We offer them for credit and you can also take them for non-credit and you'll just pay out of pocket for those lessons, but they're only $8 for that half hour. So probably a lot cheaper than lessons you've had to pay for in the past. Um, this question is kind of now really geared towards Peter. This is for you. Um, students is interested in electro music production, composition. Can you talk a little about opportunities related to that? Yeah, maybe the first thing to note is that actually secondary lessons are available in those areas too, um, in composition, in the Tamara department, in um, jazz and jazz composition. Um, so secondary study is available across the board in the conservatory. Um, there are a lot of entry points for that kind of interest. And some of them actually reside in the College of Arts and Sciences. We have a lot of faculty um, and teaching staff in the college that um, cover topics that include music and sound production, either from a practical hands-on point of view or from a, a theoretical, historical, sociological, philosophical point of view. Um, in the conservatory, those entry points sometimes are formal um, courses that happen during the semester. Sometimes they're part of Oberlin's winter term. We can talk about uh, winter term projects. Um, sometimes they're very individualized, like in the case of secondary study, or sometimes they're you know, group experiences like a class. Um, but just about all of our departments have, have entry level classes and the, the Tamara department where my teaching home is, is, is one of those. So we offer in a typical year, I'd say probably three or four, at least uh, 100 level uh, classes that are the entry points for that kind of a work. Um, so our intro classes cover um, microphones and digital audio production and uh, the creation of original work. It's very much a composition production focused um, program. So it's using the tools, but using them in the service of creating your own new music. Um, and then people sometimes will progress beyond those intro levels into mid and upper level courses. Um, Ryan mentioned, you know, that he came to Oberlin as a college student and joined the conservatory. That same thing sometimes happens in composition and tomorrow and jazz composition. So um, plenty more details that I can share about that if people have further questions, but um, maybe that's the place to start and we can yeah. probably put some links there too. Yes, indeed. And um, I just want to say for all of you all attending out there, at the end of the session, I will be including the email addresses for our faculty and staff so you can follow up with them if you have any questions. Um, and if our students are okay with that, I can share your emails as well if you'd like to be contacted about your cool, wonderful experiences. Um, we were getting a couple of more questions about secondary lessons, so I kind of wanted to address those before moving on to minors, which is going to be our next point of conversation. Um, I did include a link in the chat where you can find out about information about how the audition process works, as well as the logistics regarding student teachers. You can have a new student teacher every semester. Sometimes you may want to stick with the same person. Sometimes you may 
level up in a sense and move on to working with the faculty members should there be space um, in their teaching schedule and uh, teaching load. Um, and so there's a lot of flexibility with that. Um, secondary lessons can be a part of um, our music minor that we offer in the conservatory, which is new this year. Um, musical studies students, of course, can take secondary lessons. In fact, Peter, I think musical studies majors have to take secondary lessons. Oh no, that's a new change. It's a change. Um, but yeah, so, but musical studies majors can take secondary lessons should they be interested in doing that. Peter, would you mind um, following up with some information about our new minor programs, including the interdivisional ones? Yeah, absolutely. So this is a really an exciting addition that's um, come to fruition over the last year or so. Um, the short version is that whether you're in the college or the conservatory, there are lots of ways to engage in formal study in either direction. So if you're in the conservatory, you can have a minor in the college, for instance. Um, for a long time, we've had what we call our double degree program, where students have a, a major in the conservatory and a major in the college. But these new initiatives towards minors have made it much more possible for students to do a slightly scaled down and often more realistic and, and frankly, I think more impactful because it's, it's more reasonable version of that. So conservatory students can do a minor in the college and college students can do a minor in music, um, as Ryan was alluding to. It's very intentionally a flexible minor where you total 20 credits or more of engagement with uh, musical activities in just about any form. So classes, lessons, ensembles, again, some of that might even happen in the College of Arts and Sciences. Much of it would happen in the conservatory music, but it's very um, openly defined. Then we have a new suite of more thematic minors that intentionally cross over between the college and the conservatory. <clears throat> and we can put links to all of these, but for instance, one of them is music and cognition. Uh, you know, Oberlin has a rich uh, history in the STEM fields, generally speaking, but particularly in areas like neuroscience and psychology, for instance, for an undergraduate institution. And so that's a, an area where we, for the last decade, have seen a lot of students interested in combining what happens on campus in the conservatory and the college, taking their work in neuroscience and psychology and putting it in conversation with things like um, music theory, musical acoustics, um, composition and sound design and things like that. So these new thematic minors, and there are five of them total, are built around those kinds of topics that we have on campus. We have faculty working on these things, students working on these things, alumni out in the world. And they're also, I think, um, uh, good ways to, to frame um, experiences that will be relevant to students when they graduate from here. Um, so that kind of, you know, music and cognition or arts and creative technology that can put, um, put a name to interdisciplinary interests and projects so that when students are looking at careers, at graduate schools, at fellowships, they have their, their major, of course, on their transcript, but they can also start to really organize their ideas and their work around these um, interdivisional um, themes that we have uh, more than more than most campuses. So um, again, happy to talk more about those. Each of those has its own sort of set of conversations. Um, Jody's been involved in that. Um, and uh, Olivia, who's a musical studies major, knows a lot about some of those um, uh, pieces of that. The musical studies major uh, at Oberlin is a longstanding way for arts and sciences students to to again sort of formalize their engagement with uh, music and is again intentionally very open-ended and we've just made a few more revisions to make it even more open-ended in fact in terms of what that engagement looks like. Awesome so this next question is actually for the students we've talked a lot already about kind of our structured musical opportunities in the conservatories ensembles classes lessons can you both talk a little bit about kind of the music scene outside of the conservatory? What if I'm a singer songwriter? What if I'm interested in being in a rock band? What opportunities are available for me as a student? Not, not me, but you know, me as in the hypothetical student me. 
Um, okay, I can start. Um, yeah, just speaking from um, my experience, there's a lot of opportunities for like uh, musicians or, you know, singer songwriters to perform and like showcase their work. Um, for example, um, there are soul sessions in A House, which I'm a big fan of and I've performed in a few. Um, and it's really just um, a like safe space for performers. It's like an open mic kind of um, within the African Heritage House um, community and you know like everyone's invited to come to the house and you just perform um you can usually there's a sign-up sheet that goes around um and you can perform your work it can be original it can be whatever um you want and so that's a really good way um to perform um and then there's also um other opportunities, like if you're more like, if you like making playlists and like more like listening to music and stuff, um, you can also go to the SCO or you can DJ a SCO night, um, which is the SCO for those of you who don't know is like, um, it's in the basement of Wilder. And it's basically like a lot of people kind of call it like the Oberlin club, but it's like, you just go um, and when, you know, in like a normal time when we're in person, you know, you go, you party with your friends, um, but I've DJed a SCO night. I did a gospel SCO night for the um, Black History Month um, events last year. And so that's also another way to kind of be involved in like music outside of, you know, in a more informal kind of way um, and have a good time. So those are just two examples from my experience. Totally. Thank you for that. Um, yes, you can totally DJ the SCO. Um, and when you mentioned DJing the SCO, that reminded me of um, WOBC, which is our free form college and community radio station. I have been the classical director, like a staff member at WOBC, and I've had um, shows, I think, five or six semesters now in Oberlin, like a whole, a whole slew of them. Um, that is a place to go if you love talking because you can have talk shows or if you genuinely love music and just want to share it with the college and community um it also doesn't have to be music it can be a hybrid of talk show it can be a, like an interviewing show any essentially anything that's appropriate to put on air um and that's just been that's just been a wonderful part of Oberlin and it's a big reason I'm surprised at how big of a reason it was why I wanted to go to Oberlin that's one of the biggest things I remembered from my for my tour, my first tour. I just thought that was so cool. I'm like college radio, wow, so fun. Um, yes, absolutely. Also part of um, WOBC and usually hosted in the SCO but is now outside this year and happening this year, which is exciting. But we also have a cover band showcase, um, which is so fun. That's if you have a group that you love um, to play with um, together usually popular music, rock music, kind of anything you want to do. Um, that is a fantastic event. Um, so yeah, there's that. Also at Oberlin, we do have a large uh, folk scene. We usually every spring have um, a folk fest and we bring in um, lovely artists. I think one year we had um, Margaret Glassby and also some other fabulous artists as well. Um, also in the co-ops, which is a whole other part of Oberlin. I lived in Tank my second year. We would often host a folk nights. And that was a thing known in the Oscar community where folk musicians in and outside of the conservatory would gather in a very intimate space and play music for each other. Um, and I feel like a lot of times at Oberlin um, in the student dorms or in, or in co-ops or kind of anywhere, there's just a lot of like music in the moment that happens. Also, the cat and the cream is reminding me that usually Friday afternoons, they've been outside this year, Friday afternoons, um, jazz, jazz combos perform and it's called Jazz Forum. Um, and students are, are encouraged to like give feedback to the musicians, which has always been so fun. Um, but the cat and the cream is a very like intimate um, coffee house space um, where we also have like open mics like anything that you want to perform there too, um, which is really fun. We also host musical performances there, bring in artists. Um, so yeah, there's so many, so many different places. There are also, um, and part of, as part of our Exco programs, there are student-led steel pan uh, groups, taiko groups, um, which is a form of Japanese uh, percussion. Um, and we also have the Gamelan Ensemble, typically. The professor that teaches that is on sabbatical this year and the Brazilian Ensemble, I could go on. Um, but I was once asked in a, in a student panel what kind of student like wouldn't fit in at Oberlin. And this was like, I was with other students on this panel. And we all kind of agreed that students 
who don't like listen to or enjoy music, it might be hard because music is so diffuse at Oberlin and it, it enters the, the very most, the smallest parts of students' lives in a very intimate way. So it's kind of everywhere, but those are a few examples and I'm sure I'm missing some. No, you, you covered a lot of things. Thank you for that. And I've included a bunch of links. So I hope you all have that chat open because lots of links and lots of good information is put in there. And actually, I want to share a link to an FAQ that we created last year after doing one of these exact kind of webinars. A lot of you are asking some wonderful questions, and I think you'll find many of the answers on this FAQ. If you're interested in practice room availability, if you're interested in you know, music related to specific cultures. There was a question about Indian music, and I'm grateful for Olivia for bringing up the Javanese gamelan, um, specifically thinking of music from Indonesia. But there's all sorts of other groups on campus. So feel free to check out this FAQ. Just posted that in the link. Jody, I'd love for you to talk a little bit more about PACE and what that division is all about, particularly but just because I'm really interested in it. Um, there's a really cool, a couple of cool programs uh, at the Grafton Correctional Facility that I know that kind of are connected to the PACE division. So if you can talk a little bit about all of that, that'd be wonderful. Thank you for asking. And Olivia, I agree about the WOBC radio DJing. That was one of my favorite things that I've done in the past few years. It's just one of those things that we do in terms of collaborations with students and faculty and just having fun, too. It's not all just work and academic stuff. Anyway, um, to get back to PACE, PACE stands for Pedagogy, Advocacy and Community Engagement. It's a relatively new division and program uh, in the conservatory, but it is open to college students and conservatory students. And this is one of these moments, you heard it here first moments, right? Okay, get ready for this. Um, uh, there is an integrative concentration that is now available through the PACE division. That means that students who are interested in teaching and learning, those students who are interested in community engagement as an artist teacher, those students who are interested in um, doing community-based learning, uh, advocacy, how to become an arts advocate. The PACE really is a hub of um, those sorts of experiences. Ryan referenced uh, some of the work of mine at the Grafton Prison. I founded five years ago, almost six years ago, uh, the OMAG, Oberlin Music at Grafton Choir uh, at a state penitentiary, uh, all male choir. And as a part of the course and outside of the course, um, there are students who go with me to be uh, section leaders, to be student conductors, assistant conductors at the prison. Um, Pre-COVID, of course, um, we look forward to a return of that. But that's not the only program. There's also a strings program. Rebecca Schazberger does Oberlin Strings pre-COVID and hopefully post-COVID, uh, where instruments from the conservatory are given to the men, loaned to the men at the prison, and they are able to take the instruments into their cells and practice and come together and form um, uh, a, an ensemble that performs a variety of, of musics and, and their own compositions as far as that goes. Also then in the College of Arts and Sciences is a course that is led by Jay, uh, Janet Fiscio, um, and that is as part of the environmental studies. So um, Oberlin is unique in that we are looking at all the nooks and crannies, um, those places that might have been overlooked as spaces that can be safe spaces for musical engagement and musical access and social justice. And so um, we're really excited uh, that students who have a penchant for music and uh, engaging in the community and or specifically teaching and learning that this new concentration is available. It's not just the courses that one takes as a part, there are four courses, but also experiential components, as in your own experiences, maybe a winter, a, a winter term internship, say that five times, or a summer internship, uh, some other project that you might be engaged in in the community. Uh, such that you learn the ethics of community engagement. So that's the overview, but um, it's very exciting uh, that there that this is available for the college and the conservatory students alike. 
Thanks, awesome. Ryan. Yeah, thank you for all that wonderful information. Peter, um, I would love if you can talk a little bit about um, some, some conservatory classes that college students can take, particularly related to composition. We're getting a lot of questions about composing, student composers in the college, and I'd love for maybe you can talk a little bit about the academic resources and opportunities we have available for them. Yeah, absolutely. I'm glad a lot of questions are rolling in about that. Um, I, I would echo what Olivia and, and others have said. I think that the you know music pervades campus here in a way that um, is, is seldom the case. Uh, I think at, at most campuses, so it, it is sort of all around. And, and I would I would actually extend that to the arts more generally. I mean, we're here obviously to talk about music, but I think that you know it it so naturally combines with dance and with theater and with creative writing, with visual art and performance art and cinema studies and all sorts of other enterprises that are happening around campus. So I think a lot of what we're saying here could be extrapolated out to the arts more generally rather than just music. Um, you know, it, I, I think it's it's pretty fair to say that there are very few courses in the conservatory that are not open to everybody on campus. Um, just like in any department, there are courses that require you to be working at a certain level. So just like in chemistry, you might have, you know, three or four points of entry, some classes that are designed specifically for non-majors, some classes that are designed as the first course you would take as a major. And then depending on your interest level and, and abilities after those classes, you may or may not progress through mid-level and upper level classes. And really that is largely the same in the conservatory. We have some standalone classes that are designed specifically for non-majors, for somebody who wants to come in, you know, doesn't have a lot of experience, take a single class, they're sophomore year, then maybe come back and take something else their senior year. So we have those in musicology and music theory and uh, in Tamara, my department and, and in other areas. And as was mentioned earlier, we have ensembles that work like that too. Musical Union, for instance, um, who for somebody who maybe has some background in singing, but is not a real high level singer. Um, then we have courses that are the beginning of of a kind of sequence. So our music theory sequence, for instance, um, has a common starting point, whether you're a conservatory student or a college student, everybody starts with the first section of music theory. And then you might progress further than that if you're interested and, and if that goes well. Uh, and that would be the case in, in the Tamar department, in the composition department, in just about um, any department in the conservatory, there, there would be that kind of more formal entry point and then the possibility to progress. Um, and many college students do in fact progress and work at least at the kind of 200 level. Um, typically the, the upper, upper level classes in the conservatory, um, while they are available to anybody who's made it through that sequence, you almost would have had to have been a major in the conservatory to kind of get that far by your junior year. Um, uh, so often college students are taking 100 and 200 level classes, um, although even as I say that I'm thinking of a lot of exceptions that I know about of college students in 300 level classes, so I, I, I think I go back to my original answer, which is there are actually very few things in the conservatory that aren't uh, available um, to college students, but but I would the only caveat I would add is to think of it as that kind of sometimes sequential pattern, just like it would be in any other department around campus. Um, Ev, I know you're, you're just in your second year. Olivia, you're in your fourth year. I mean, I know Olivia, I know from seeing your transcript that you, you know, you've taken upper level classes in the conservatory. I say that as a musical studies advisor, not as someone just stalking Olivia's transcript. Um, but I don't know if you want to talk about that a little bit about your, totally. your experience of kind of working up through there. Yes, I wouldn't mind if you did. I have nothing to hide. Um, but no, I really um, took a liking to music theory. Perhaps maybe it's nerdy. I know the music theory cycle is usually usually a cycle that a lot of students kind of want to like get out of the way as much as we love our theory professors. Um, it's just it's just the rudiments of, of music knowledge and it's being revitalized right now as we speak, which is really exciting. But no, I took music theory one and aural skills one through four, um, which musical study students are not required to do. I think you have to take two music theory courses. Um, 
and I'm not remembering exactly oral skills right now, but there is a music theory element to musical studies. Um, and then I took oral skills five because I really love vocal music and wanted to sing some modus novus and atonal music and also work with um, Brian Allegon, who's the chair of the, of the theory department at Oberlin. Um, and because that semester was a COVID semester, it ended up the second half kind of being like a private reading with him on, on like kind of dissecting a piece of, a piece of work that I, that I wanted to do in a very like theoretical framework. Um, and it was really interesting. So yeah, that, that is a, an element of the conservatory that I had no pressure to take, but I just really enjoyed it. And um, I will say that from my first day, first semester at Oberlin, I made my way into like a music theory class, um, which those classes, as we know, um, college students might be intimidated because they are reserved for conservatory students who like need that for their degree. Um, but I'm quite persistent. And like, uh, like uh, Dean Swenson said, um, there's the little classes that that college students wouldn't be able to take if you want to take them. So yes, music theory. Awesome, so much wonderful information and so many wonderful questions in the chat. I wanna kind of follow up there talking about academic resources and opportunities. There was a question about um, jazz studies and classes for beginners. And I just wanna highlight a couple of opportunities. One is our um, beginning voice class. I'm not exactly sure about the, the, the specific course title, but um, Professor Lisa Stidham um, teaches this class for non-voice majors in the conservatory as well as college students who are interested in developing their vocal technique and getting more comfortable with singing in public and around people. And so it's a wonderful class if you're interested in learning more about um, vocal arts. Um, jazz students actually have great access to the jazz studies department. It really is open in the sense that you'll do an audition in the beginning of the year and based upon that, if you have the harmonic vocabulary and the chops to keep up with the, the students uh, who are majoring in the jazz studies division, you can be placed in some of the combos or even the um, our Oberlin Jazz Ensemble. And so there's lots of opportunity there. We even have um, kind of a small a small ensemble opportunity for our, our classical instrumentalists, and this is through our um, Arts and Sciences Chamber Music course that is currently being taught by our quartet in residence, the Verona Quartet. And so students who are interested in playing in quartets or quintets can audition be placed into this class, and they even get um, individual lessons with members of the quartet. So it's a lot of fun opportunity there. Um, Peter, am I missing anything related to that? No? No, I, we have uh, these beginning classes in voice and in guitar and in piano. Yes. So again, for students who want to try something new um, or, or you know, starting at a kind of basic level with maybe formal uh, written notation performance, you know, who maybe played an instrument for a while, but want to get more uh, comfortable with with reading notated music. We have a lot of uh, spots in those classes. And that's in addition to the secondary lessons we discussed earlier. Um, yeah, and Tiffany and the Verona Quartet have been working together really closely um, since that quartet arrived. So there are a lot of students um, that are uh, moving between the chamber music setting and the Oberlin Arts and Sciences Orchestra setting and secondary lessons, either formally or as part of the chamber music coaching. So there are a lot of good connections happening, um, I think in that way too, that I'm sure Tiffany could talk more about. Sure, I'd be happy to, yeah. Um, it, it's really been great to collaborate with the Verona Quartet because we believe that you know, really great music education is sort of three pronged that there's the lessons and there's the large ensemble and there's a small ensemble. So we really try to integrate our programs. And uh, there's some chamber music in the Open Arts and Sciences Orchestra this semester, particularly due to COVID, but also because it was a great opportunity to do that. And the Verona Quartet actually worked with us in the context of the Open Arts and Sciences Orchestra. And I appear as a um, guest and I help coach some of the string quartets and trios as part of their class too. So there's a little bit of cross um, pollination there in terms of the faculty and the experiences that we share together. As part of the um, orchestra, we also have a um, program in which uh, the cons conservatory students serve as teaching assistants. And these conservatory students actually teach private lessons as part of the orchestra program to specifically help the students who want that extra attention. 
So there's a lot of ways to get individualized attention, whether it's through this class or that class or the other class, and we try to really integrate everything. Yeah, and I, I would just add maybe just circling back to the questions coming in from composers, there are a lot of, um, again, sort of entry points to that study, but also opportunities to see work come to fruition at Oberlin. So I think this happens um, through some of the ensembles and performers that we've been talking about, college composers getting their works performed. Um, and it also happens through the other arts that I've been talking about. So there's a lot of collaboration between student dancers, for instance, and student composers, um, where uh, composition students and Tamara students and um, improvisers and you know folks making all different sorts of music are making that um, for dance performances, using it for theater productions and as the root elements of sound design for film and for onstage theater. Um, we haven't talked specifically about some of the student organizations like Ampta and Asta, which are um, put on you know full blown productions of musical theater and. Um, uh, and other stage events. And then, um, oh boy, I mean, a, a lot of other opportunities often in the form of winter term projects. We had last year a film composer from LA, Adam Cohen, who's an Oberlin uh, alum who wrote all the music for the TV show Psych, if you've uh, been binge watching things over the last year. And Adam was here to do a winter term residency for which we had about 10 students, uh, if memory serves, Almost half of them were college students um, for that um, uh, winter term project. So um, again, I think a lot of both entry points, but then also ways that you can see that music come to life, both formally and informally around campus. And you talking about AMTA and student compositions, I'm, I'm reminded of Alex No, who um, was an amazing student here at Oberlin, musical studies student in the college who was very much so into musical theater and actually had one of his compositions performed. This is actually the perfect place given the tight-knit community that is true to Oberlin um, and how pervasive and, and permeating music is here on our campus that if you are someone who's looking to collaborate with other students or if you're a composer looking to have students perform your music, you'll definitely find a welcome community here. Um, and I believe also, I actually went to, there was a jazz composition major who was really into uh, musical theater. He was a big fan of Sondheim and he actually had one of his pieces performed with students, like a mini pit orchestra at the Cat and the Cream Coffee House during one of AMTA's um, musical theater reading workshops that they do each semester. So do look at that link I just put in the chat. AMTA stands for Oberlin Musical Theater Association. It's a long-standing student group here on campus um, that is dedicated to musical theater. And as a singer, I cannot say that I, I um, I'm, have not like dabbled in a little bit of that in my time at Oberlin. I definitely love my musical theater. I'm seeing a lot of questions related to um, adding the conservatory. So I kind of want to address that really quickly. And then I want to throw some questions towards the students again. We're getting a couple of questions about kind of larger facilities and other genres of music that I'd love for you all to talk about. But so basically the process um, to add the conservatory, we call it the change of status process. And students who are in their first or second year are eligible to um, go through this process. If you're a third year looking to at the college, you definitely would need to kind of talk with some of the deans just to make sure that you're on track to graduate and that you'd be able to finish all the requirements in time. Typically those students will add the conservatory if they are accepted in their first or second year. Um, and that process is not too different from what students who might have already applied for the conservatory have went through. You won't have to do the common application though. We, we kind of cut that part out. What you will have to do is complete a form um, which is basically a short application that lets us know more information about the instrument area that you're looking to apply in um, and your background in music. And then we advise you to meet with our director of conservatory admissions as well as um, one of our deans in the conservatory dean's office. Um, and from there, you'd basically go through an abbreviated audition process. You'd send in screening materials if the area you're um, looking to apply in is a screened area. And this year, we actually screened in almost every area. So you will 
we'll probably have to send in some kind of pre-recorded um, material for our faculty to review. Um, if you're a composer looking to add on composition or tomorrow, you probably will have a conversation with those faculty in those respective departments before you kind of jump through the process of submitting any portfolio materials. Um, should the faculty like what they hear, so to say, so to speak, um, you'll be invited to either have an interview with faculty or complete an audition. And this will be with other high school students around that same time, which happens in the January, February timeframe. Um, sometimes in specific cases, it can happen outside of that during juries that happen at the end of the semester, but oftentimes they happen during our, our regular audition season. And then should um, that audition be successful, um, you'd be admitted into the double degree program. You'd start that in the following semester. And so that was basically the process I did. I was here in the college and I, I went to Performer Arts High School, so I knew I loved music, but I wasn't sure if my mom, my mom really was the one. She told me I should major in something like psychology or, or biology or something, and I just don't like sciences like that. They're great though. Um, but so instead I came here and I was like, I'm gonna major in English and musical studies. And I was taking lessons, private secondary lessons in the conservatory. I was taking some theory classes. I was enrolled in the college choir. I even got a job in the music library. I tried to really kind of infiltrate the conservatory in that sense. And in the second year, I did that audition and I was able to add the conservatory. And so um, that pro that's basically the process. I will say though, given the fact that um, unlike the college, we have to play a little bit by the numbers in the conservatory, it's not always guaranteed that you will get admitted. And I know that's kind of like the, the negative, the downside, no one wants to hear that, but I do wanna share that information just kind of being open, right? So while the college can have 200 English majors, we would go crazy if we had 200 voice majors. I would know what all of those singers would do. Um, so, Olivia, that face is... <laughs> exactly. So, um, so we do have to kind of keep it a bit limited also for our studio sizes to ensure that our students get a meaningful interaction with their studio teacher. So, we are winding down on time. So, I want to kind of let you all know we're going to do our best to kind of get to, through all these questions. Again, a lot of these questions can be, the answers can be found in our Music uh, Opportunities FAQ, which I linked before. I'll link that again before we end up. But, Olivia, Ev, can you all talk a little bit about, and I know you already have, but maybe you can talk a little bit more about some of the opportunities you spoke about, a cappella groups, um, cover band showcases. What if I'm in a studio band? I know Olivia, Studio B is something connected to WOBC, right? Maybe you can talk a little bit about what that opportunity is like. Give us some information. Let's, yeah. um, so yes, as you mentioned, um, live from Studio B um, is um, an EXCO class that you can take. You can you can, uh, okay, let me rewind. Yes, Studio B is attached to WOBC. You can take an EXCO if you'd like to be involved um, in Studio B, kind of behind the scenes, learning how to do um, live musical production and live streaming, um, and also recording of artists. And if you are an artist, you can also perform live from Studio B. I do not know the exact details of what it would take to like apply and to get on the show, but because so many student performers do it, I don't think um, it's an extraneous process. I also know um, one of the people that that directs it, so I have direct access to to a student to ask questions about that. Um, but yeah, oh, what else? What else is there? There's probably a lot. Um, like I like I mentioned before, um, some of the some of the percussion ensembles I have always had kind of like a a distant jealousy of, especially now since I am graduating Oberlin, that is an area of Oberlin that I wish I had, um, that I, I wish I had taken the opportunity to be in because I, when I got to Oberlin, I was very overwhelmed by the conservatory, very much wanted to infiltrate it, infiltrate it, like you said, Ryan. And because of conducting, I've took, taken like a very classical route, um, which is fine. That's okay. But I wish that perhaps one of the semesters where I, I wasn't in college choir or I wasn't, I wasn't taking like an extra theory class or something, maybe perhaps I would have taken like Exco or, or Steel Pan or another semester in Gamelon since that was cut short by COVID-19. Um, and there's also a fantastic um, year long course in um, internalizing rhythms taught by Jamie Haddad, who is a professor of jazz studies um, and improvisation. And that's open to college conservatory jazz students. And that's something I wish I had taken. Um, 
but yeah, very, very ensconced in the Western classical tradition, uh, which is fine, but that's not all there is. So those are, those are some facets of Oberlin that I really wanted to take and that I thought I would mention because they are very lively parts of Oberlin's campus again. Um, and again, the Brazilian ensemble taught by Professor Catherine Metz, who is a professor of ethnomusicology um, in the conservatory, that you don't need any um, musical experience to join that. It's very welcoming, kind of in the same vein as musical union. So yeah, those are just just some more things I thought I would plug because um, I feel like I say a lot before. I'm sure I'm I'm sure I'm missing some more. Ev, I don't know if you have any other. Ev, would you, would you like to join anything in that? Um, I mean, honestly, I think you kind of encompass everything. Um, I just want to, you know, put it out there that there's obviously so many ways to get um, involved in music and like, you know, have fun with it. Um, I know for me, I've kind of in the past struggled a little bit with like music being stressful at times because, you know, there's such like a competitiveness, but I feel like at Oberlin, I haven't really felt that. Um, and I think also part of that is me being in the arts and sciences. Um, but it's still, Oberlin has so many opportunities where you can be involved in music and not have it be a stressful environment where you can have fun, you get to play music. Um, so yeah, I definitely would say um, be involved in like acapella groups um, and there's, tons of like over uh there's tons of like open mic kind of things and like you know places where you can sign up and perform for people there's lots of opportunities on campus for that so take advantage of those opportunities awesome thank you all so much so it is seven o'clock on the hour and we made it through most but not almost all of the questions um so i want to put the email addresses of our panelists and i encourage you to follow up with them if you have any other questions my email address will also be included if you um want to follow up with questions about the double degree program adding that as a college student olivia ab is it okay if i also share your email addresses yeah awesome so here goes that boom Peter, Jody, Tiffany, me, Olivia, Ev, those are all of the, the email addresses. Feel free to reach out. Um, there was so much that we covered in this session. There's still so much to talk about. This could be another whole hour <laughs> to this session if we continued. Um, but I hope this was fun. I hope this was informative. I hope that you learned a little bit about the musical scene here at Oberlin. And thank you. Congratulations for being admitted. Um, and I can't wait to see you here in the fall. Thank you.